Hello everyone, I'm Arturo Mesquit, the anxiety-free professional doctor, helping people find fulfillment in life. And today, I have John Livesey on the other line. Welcome, John. Thanks for having me. Now, John, he's a keynote speaker and a best-selling author of many books. What is the name of your latest book, John? Better Selling Through Storytelling. That's a, such a catchy title, John. So why don't you take us back to the time when you first experienced anxiety? So everyone who's ever been in school has this experience, no matter what, oh, however old you are. Um, so I think I'm maybe six or something. And, you know, my parents are dressing up and they're going out for the parent-teacher conference where the teachers tell the parents how their child is doing. That's my first memory of anxiety. I was so stressed out, I was almost sick to my stomach, worried about what the teacher was going to say to my parents about me. Now, I've never been in trouble, you know, I'm, well, can you, you know, it's not like there was homework or anything in first grade. My parents came home and they said, what are you so worried about? She said you're one of her favorite students. Arturo, I have no idea where that anxiety came from. But that was my first memory of anxiousness. And then it just continued to build where I would think, oh, I've got to be the best student to be loved. Uh, I was a competitive swimmer, became a lifeguard. Well, I, I, I better have really good results. I better win lots of medals and trophies. And, the, you know, and so all of that was constantly trying to prove myself. I didn't have a sense of who I was, was enough without all these accomplishments attached to it. I mean, I was in choir and I was in the marching band and I was in the high school musicals and I was on the swim team. So I was very busy but not particularly happy unless it was attached to, oh, you did good, you won that race, or you got a good grade, or you were great on stage. Um, that was a good performance. But the overall sense was um, I have to produce, in, I, as soon as was my whole philosophy, as soon as I get good grades, then I'll get into a good university, and then maybe I'll be happy. And then when I got to university, it was, well, as soon as I, can graduate here, I can get out of this freezing cold Midwest Chicago, and then I'll be happy. And then as soon as I get an, uh, a car, I'll be happy and a good job, I'll be happy. And I, for so long, I was never letting myself be in the moment, which is where any kind of peace of mind exists. I was either reliving the past, I can't believe somebody said or did that to me, or worried about the future. Majority of my time was worried about the future. And so uh, the anxiety I typically have is around that. Okay. Now let's, let's take you into the adult years. Let me know when those start. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. I, you got me for a moment. So. Uh, who said I'm an adult? Yes. Uh, <laughs> I'm a Peter Pan, forever young, in my look, outlook at yes. Uh, let's see. Well, it just went from worrying about my grades to worrying about hitting my quota as a salesperson in my adult years and worrying about, oh, um, am I going to get fired if I don't make this sale? Or, you know, and then I was worried about, you know, um, rejection and dealing with clients saying, ah, nope, don't want you, don't want what you're selling, bye-bye. So it was an um, ongoing journey of going, I got to find some basis for who I am. And that really is what put me on my own little spiritual path of becoming aware of I'm more than just this body or I'm more than just what I have or what I do and and starting and that started you know oh meditation you know became uh, on my radar that's not something that anybody I grew up with <laughs> talked about or did and uh, so that really has started back then to give me a different perspective of Oh, there's. More. I remember hearing Jerry Jampolsky, who wrote some books uh, like Love is Letting Go of Fear, talk about how he would go to talk to prisoners and say, your body is in prison, but your mind isn't. And there's a lot of people who are free in the world who might as well be in prison the way they think about their life. And I thought, oh, wow, that's so profound. I don't want to be one of those people who are physically free, but not mentally free. How you handle anxiety as a young boy yes. through foods. And yes. then we get into the adult life. Now, now we're tapping into being recognized at work. Correct. Yeah. Yes. And like, you literally like your paycheck. You, you know, you, then I was in this vicious world of comparing myself to other people. 
oh, am I going to make this list of 30 great people under 30 years old? Probably not. Does that mean I'm not good? No. <laughs> but, you know, there's always something to, if you start comparing yourself to other people, that is the big trigger for anxiety, I have found. Then spirituality, self-help books, your writing, of course, starts to, to yes. manifest in your, life, in your life, right? It did, actually. Um, you know, I was reading a lot of spiritual self-help books. Um, well, I remember reading The Four Agreements was a big one. Don't take things personally. And especially for me, I thought, wow, in sales, that's so easy to do, to take the rejection personally. What if I didn't do that? And then I had read a lot of books on business, like One Minute Manager. You know, focus on catching yourself or somebody else doing something right for just a minute and acknowledge it. And I thought, gosh, is there a book that combines these two, it's business and metaphysics? And there wasn't. And that's what inspired me to write my first book, gosh, 16 years ago now. And um, it was interesting because I'd be writing about always be kind to yourself. And then I'd get a call from an angry client. And I was like, oh, I guess I better walk my talk here and not react to their anger. And I actually had one of the best years of my whole career while I was working on my first book because it was constantly in my consciousness. Now, when do I come in? Because I know we've done uh, yes. different levels, different, different um, levels of um, working with, yeah. with you not only on a, um, working with you in person as well as on, on the phone. So yeah. when do I come in? Enter the Yoda, the mentor, if you will, the Sherpa, if you're climbing Mount Everest. Arturo enters this story. You're so worried about the hero, in this case, me. How is he ever going to make it? How is he going to find meaning in his life? How is he ever going to deal with his eating obsessions and his sugar roller coaster? And I first reached out to you around nutrition and said, I am just obsessed with food. When I'm not eating it, I'm thinking about it and we're wondering what I can eat next. And I'm never satisfied after I eat something. And I beat myself up for the, if I gain weight and my whole self-esteem is tied to what I look like. And I just want to get off that roller coaster and enter you. And you're like, let's take a breath here and let's figure out what you're feeling and where you're feeling it. And that was a big aha for me. I'm like, where I'm feeling it. What do you mean? Uh, well, I had, I had never checked in with myself like that. You mean my stomach or my throat or is it a headache? So that was a big uh, aha for me. At first we worked quite a lot, but then we stopped working together. Then you would uh, reach out, I would check in with you. And so we have sort of worked together in, in, on many levels. But um, based on the work that we have done, how do the phone sessions work for you? They're remarkable. First of all, I'm always amazed how fast I can go from feeling so anxious or sad or scared. And it's not that you do some kind of voodoo magic breathing exercises. It's that you take me on this. It's almost like I'm not hypnotized, but I'm in a different state. And you're going back and having me visualize every possible time in my life or even other lifetimes when this feeling was there and somehow visualizing that going into let's say a bowl and then putting that making that bowl uh, become ashes helps me let go of it and I'm not stuck in this endless loop of perseverating and thinking about the same thoughts over and over again what really comes to mind is when my sister was diagnosed with ovarian cancer and I was really anxious I thought she was gonna die, the, the prognosis was bad, and I just couldn't even fathom my life without her. And I started getting emotional, I couldn't stop crying, and, and uh, that was really traumatic for me. And you really helped me reframe how I look at death, for one thing, and uh, let go of the need to control everything, or even be responsible for it, and then the awareness that, are you really helping your sister by being so upset? Mm -hmm. Is this some kind of proof to her how much you love her that you're already grieving and she's not gone? So, and I'm happy to say she's still with us. So then when I look back on all that time that I was so unhappy and scared and sad um, of, ooh, what a waste of energy. And so you, you helped me get out of that and I will always be grateful for that. Great, that's, that's wonderful. So today you're able to handle 
live stressors in a much calmer way. Agree? Agree. And that doesn't mean that there still aren't life stressors. You know, I um, just found out a friend of mine from college that has the virus, right? And it reminds me of the 80s when you'd find out somebody had AIDS and it gets all triggered and you start going, not everybody dies from the virus. Not everybody died from it. You know, back at, the, at one point, it seemed like it was a death sentence for sure. Um, so it's not my first rodeo at dealing with a pandemic, but... Uh, I think, so we have our own issues, right? Oh, I just got, I moved. It was my choice, but it still produces some anxiety. How do I deal with this? And then people you love and care about have their world and their story going on and it comes into your story. And then it's a whole nother skill set to how can I be empathetic without taking on their pain? And I would say that's what you're the real master of because this is what you do for a living. Imagine if you were feeling every sadness and stressor that you, your clients were, you couldn't function. I had to learn the hard way. I mean, at first, I'm someone who can sense a lot. Uh, not only, well, let's just call it the five sensory stimulus. And so I had to learn the hard way to find neutrality as I'm working with someone because it's, a, it's an endless movement of energies. And so definitely, yeah, it's... Uh, one must be completely neutral and able to, to carry on someone else's uh, the trauma, if you want to call it. Right. Uh, now, speaking, speaking of trauma and, and, and chaos, uh, how are you handling the situation today? Do you find yourself in a stable place uh, emotionally, mentally? It's a very interesting phenomena for me because for the most part, I feel grounded emotionally. I'm like, I love where I live. I feel safe. Um, I'm not living in fear of catching it from, uh, you know, um, uh, or worried about even, you know, is six feet enough? You know, there's so many things you could be afraid of. Uh, is the mask working? Whatever. Um, but I did, for me, um, as you said, part of my process of dealing with anxiety is to write about it. And I wrote a, an article about it's okay to grieve now because I woke up one morning going, wait a minute, is this just a bad dream? And I thought, oh, I'm in some kind of denial. And I went, oh, that's a stage of grieving. And then there's, you know, bargaining. Well, could I do this if I, you know, could I possibly go for a walk in the park? Would that be safe? You know, I start bargaining with what are the real rules? And um, then some anger that um, if I don't agree with the way things are being handled. Uh, and a little bit of depression when I think of the lost jobs and people who are dying. And, you know, so I can really let myself, I go, but these are feelings of grief. And so when I let myself say, it's okay to grieve and realize that that's, and that you go back and forth having, you know, gone through those stages when my dad died, I go, it's not like, cause I like everything to be linear and, you know, well, check that box off. I'm no longer in denial. And now I'm in the anger stage and, you know, and you're like, Oh, what am I back in denial? So that's been the big aha for me is going, Feelings, as you said, energy are movement, and it doesn't just go from A to B. Since you are such a great writer, what, can you, what, what do you suggest for them to do? Well, it's not terribly new, but it's really effective. And even if you don't think of yourself as a writer, you can still write down two or three things that you're grateful for now. Because what that does for me and other people is it first gets you in the now. Oh, I'm grateful I'm not sick. I'm grateful I have a roof over my head. I'm grateful I have something to eat and drink. Oh my gosh. And maybe things I took for granted all the time. Like I could always go out and to a restaurant with my friends and I could, you know. And so you're like, there's a lot of things about quote, just we expected this would always be the way it was. I can always get on a plane when I want. I can go and do pretty much. And you're like, what do you mean? I can, what? So uh, even just looking at pictures of previous memories can trigger happy thoughts of, oh, I'm grateful I had that experience. I'm grateful I had that moment in the park or I'm grateful I was on that trip or I was, it's, you know, it's, for me, it always just keeps boiling down to, am I focusing on what I have or am I focusing on what I don't have? So being grateful for what you have today and just make a uh, conscious awareness of what that is, Correct. Correct. And also then I really get in touch, Arturo, with, well, what's the real source of this anxiety? And for me, it's not knowing when it's going to end. And that's the control 
part of my personality. And I thought to my, and I wrote this in the article, you know, even when you're in prison, they tell you how long you're in for. Or if you're really bad, the ultimate punishment is solitary confinement. And so isolation can feel like that. You're like, but even then they go, well, you're going into solitary confinement for 10 days. And so my mind, again, because if I'm not in the moment, I'm like, can I do this for a month? What if the whole summer's like this? What will my, how, can I go this long without hugging somebody? I think I might lose my mind. Um, so all that is a whole new level of things to work on staying neutral on, and hence the need to keep working with you. As you know, as, as I know, we all need coaches. We, know, we all need some kind of shaman, coach, mentor, confidant, whatever you want to call it. How can you place me out there? How can they benefit from working with me? Well, I think a lot of people, I was one of them, was all about perfectionism, right? As soon as I get this done, I'm healed. I never need to work on this again. And what's so odd on that is we're don't worry, we need to celebrate our progress and we need someone from the outside in looking. It was one of my favorite expressions for the work I do with consulting is it's really hard to see the outside of the label of a bottle when you're inside the bottle. So you're someone outside my bottle and you can read the label, whereas I'm inside and it's, it's, it's reverse type and it's like looking in a mirror and I can't really make it out. And you're like, no, this is what the moment is. And not only can you show me, but then you can heal it. And I think, you know, the standard is, you know, go to the dentist, what, every six months and get your teeth clean. Your car needs an oil change. And yet somehow we think, I don't need any tune-up. I don't need to check in and uh, I'll go it alone. And I just think that that is a big mistake. And so that's why I'm so grateful to have you as the person that I know can give me a tune up really fast without it getting to the place where I break down or in the example, or my teeth fall out or my car breaks down. Um, and so I think if people keep a consistent schedule with you to keep their emotions tuned up like they do everything else. I mean, you know, we got, we got to brush our teeth every day. It doesn't, you know, some, we accept that, but somehow we think, Oh, I don't need to keep working on rebalancing my emotions. Like I, one and done. Sorry, gang. It doesn't work like that. You can't just go, well, I went to the gym last month. I never have to exercise again. Right? Mm, no, you do. And this, you talk, you're moving your body. Your body needs to move every day. And guess what? The energy in your body needs to move every day. And if you're not, a, if it gets stuck, you're, you need to get it unstuck. And that's where you come in. One of the exercises that I always tell my patients to, to write down the, the problem, just yeah. brainstorm it quickly. And then we just pick a word or a phrase that really stands out. And with you, it's so easy. Right. Let's get to the root out you go in a such a neutral state, right? <laughs> you move on with yeah. the things that, you, that are more important than just focusing on thoughts. That they're just traveling around the field, not doing anything. Uh, if you think about it, if you, don't, if you don't process your thoughts or your thinking process, they're just all over the place, causing more chaos than what it really is going on. I mean, sometimes the chaos is in the mind and not in the, in the actual environment. We're all the directors of our, our, the movie in our head and, um... You know, sometimes we hit the play button unconsciously to, and we're watching a horror movie that's not even happening. Okay, any other thoughts, any other things that come to mind that you would like to share with us? You know, when you do get that energy cleared and moving and unstuck, then new ideas can come in. And I think that's the, you know, when I tell people about stories, if you look at, you know, Here's John, he, here's his background, and here's where he's had his challenges. Here's some of the problems John has. Enter Arthur, Arturo as the um, healer of that energy. And then what's life like for John after an energy session? What's the resolution of that? And that part for me is, all right, if I'm not able to speak at live events right now, oh, what if I offer to do virtual trainings and talks? What if I came up with an online course for people to take so that they could start to learn while they're, quote, not traveling? So there's a whole group of people who are in sales that would love to use this time to better their skills while they have the time 
to learn something at their own pace. So I created that. So, but none of that can really happen if you're in the fear mode and fear of flight mode. That's not where your creativity comes. So I just wanted to paint that as the final part of the story that we, that we hit on all four parts. Do you have any events that you would like to tell us? Um, well, I am going to be doing a virtual training for a medical tech company at the end of this month. So I'm happy to say that that is something um, that I'm able to do and that people want. And interestingly enough, it's created a new opportunity where they've asked me to train their outside salespeople how to sell virtually on Zoom calls because they're not comfortable with that. So if anybody is interested in improving their skills, um, they can reach out to me. I'm doing... Um, free mastermind Zoom classes on how to become a storyteller um, and they can explore, you know, who the course is for and who it's not for. And I can give you the, um, the URL for people to explore that. It's just called go from invisible to irresistible.com. And then, or if you can't remember that, you can just Google the pitch whisperer and my content shows up that way. If you cannot handle or process your anxiety on your own to reach out, you know, to reach out to me, to John, to anyone who, who you feel comf comfortable uh, with. And uh, so thank you so much, John. Well, thank you for doing what you do in the world. It's, it's needed more than ever now. Wonderful. Till then, bye for now.